Is PETA an evil organization that wants nothing more than to kill animals and take away your hamburgers? Or is there a giant corporate conspiracy designed to get you to think exactly that? Today we're going to take a look at some of the evidence as well as some of PETA's biggest scandals and see if we can figure out what's actually going on here. In case you didn't know, PETA stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals and was founded in 1980 by Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco and has a self-reported 9 million members, making it the largest animal rights organization in the world. Their slogan is, Animals are not ours to experiment on, eat, wear, use for entertainment, or abuse in any other way. The most common way that the average person interacts with PETA as a concept is typically through the comment section on something like a video, an article, or some kind of thread about PETA. This was definitely the case for me. Like, I would see that PETA had done some kind of outrageous stunt, or they had said something that had upset some people, and then I would see in the comment section there were a lot of people who had a lot of opinions about PETA and whatever it is that they had done. I had previously known, like, a little bit about PETA, I kind of knew what they stood for, but I started noticing that there was so much disdain in the way that people spoke about PETA that it made me think that there's got to be something deeper going on here. I noticed that very quickly the comment section of anything pertaining to PETA would very quickly devolve into the conversation that mainly circles around the one fact, which is PETA kills animals. And oftentimes they'll even link you with this very conveniently titled PETA kills animals website. So let's take a quick look at this website where so many people seem to be getting this information from. When we're looking at this website, we can see that they have gathered quite a bit of evidence that PETA does in fact kill animals. Uh, when we scroll through here, we can see this table and it does in fact say that PETA has an 81% kill rate of the animals that come to their shelter. And since 1998, it seems that they have killed over 47,000 animals. We go a little bit further on and we see that they say that the facility does not contain sufficient animal enclosures to routinely house the number of animals annually reported as taken into custody. You can see that PETA's status as a shelter has actually come into question and they only maintain that status on a technicality. Then it goes on to talk about a case where PETA representatives took a chihuahua from somebody's front porch and then euthanized the animal within 24 hours. This lawsuit was settled for $50,000. It then goes on to talk about some of PETA's extreme tactics, as well as some of their connections to more extremist activist group. And if this is the only website that you ever look at, and when it comes to figuring out if PETA is a good or bad organization, I can see why this is pretty jarring. I mean, they're an animal rights organization. Why are they killing animals? Let's, uh, let's check this other website. Oh man, here it says that all the animals that PETA has killed in the last 25 years could fill 225 dump trucks. And then in 2023, they've killed over 2,000 animals and only rehomed 58. However, a very important part of the conversation is often left out when we're talking about these websites. And that is that the PETA Kills Animals website is actually owned by the Center for Consumer Freedom, which now also goes under a slightly different name. But it's important, very important to know that the Center for Consumer Freedom is a nonprofit organization that is funded by companies like Monsanto, Outback Steakhouse, Tyson, Coca-Cola, Wendy's, and Anheuser-Busch. They got their startup funds in the 1990s from Philip Morris, which is a tobacco company, in order to get them to lobby against things like regulating smoking inside of restaurants. Aside from just campaigning against PETA, they're also well known for opposing groups like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Humane Society, the CDC, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Impossible and Beyond Meat, as well as things like unions and raising the minimum wage. The founder of the Center for Consumer Freedom has been described as well known in political circles for funneling anonymous corporate money into vicious campaigns attacking various advocacy groups. Basically, they use their status as a nonprofit to maintain the anonymity of their donors because obviously donating to an organization like this is a bad look. We only know about some of the donors who I mentioned above because they were um, part of a data leak. They've been known under several different names, but for a long time, they've been running the smear campaign against PETA for well over 20 years. And a huge amount of the misleadingly written and negative information that you can find on them can be tied back to the so-called Center for Consumer Freedom. So if you hate PETA because they kill animals or you just kind of hate PETA and you're not really able to articulate why, just know that you've likely been had by a propaganda campaign that was designed to make you hate PETA and to continue buying products from companies who destroy the environment and exploit animals. 
So what happens when we branch out and do our own research instead of listening to campaigns that were created to protect companies that financially benefit from you hating PETA? Well, the story starts to look pretty different. I'm gonna be using the term pet and companion animal kind of interchangeably. I know pet has negative connotations, but it just fits a little bit better in sometimes and um, Honestly, it's just a mistake I've still been making. So in the United States, which is where all the data that I'm gonna be talking about has come from, there are approximately 70 million homeless companion animals, mostly dogs and cats. Of these 70 million every year, about six to eight million get brought into shelters. Of these six to eight million, approximately three to four million get adopted every year. If my math is correct, that leaves around three to four million animals left in shelters every year. Since 1998, PETA has euthanized about 47,000 animals. I know that sounds like a lot, and we're gonna get into why an animal rights organization might euthanize animals, but for now, let's get a little bit of perspective. The data for the past few years has shown that approximately one to three million shelter animals get euthanized every year. So if we're gonna take that 25 year time frame that the PETA Kills Animals website was using, and we're gonna take the down the middle estimate of two million animals getting euthanized per year times 25, that's 50 million animals that have been euthanized in the past 25 years. It's also important to note that the number of shelter euthanizations has actually been declining. So in reality, the number is actually likely a bit higher than that, but we're just gonna use that for simplicity's sake. By that math, that means that 0.00094% of animals that have been euthanized in the past 25 years have been killed by PETA. 0.00094. So when we actually put the number of euthanizations into perspective, it turns out that PETA is in fact not mass slaughtering pets. Another really important thing that we need to understand in order for this conversation to make sense is that PETA is an open admission shelter of last resort. What this means is that PETA turns down no animal. No animal in any condition gets turned down at PETA's shelter. That means they could be sick, dying, extremely ill, or in a lot of cases, the pet or animal will come from a home that actually really cares for them and loves them, but they just can't afford the vet bill for uh, euthanasia to be done. So PETA will actually, free of cost, euthanize that animal. On the other side of that coin, we have something which is called a no-kill shelter or a selective admission shelter. A selective admission shelter or a no-kill shelter will in fact turn down animals if they are at capacity or if they deem the animal to be unadoptable for some reason like being too aggressive or being too sick because they don't want to take that animal in and then have to count that towards their kill number. So of course I'm not saying that all no-kill shelters are bad or all kill shelters are bad. There can be bad shelters in both camps, but something like a selective admission shelter can put animals into tricky situations because oftentimes when somebody's trying to surrender an animal, it's for a reason. Either the animal is sick and they're not able to take care of them or the animal is too aggressive, but no matter what, that person no longer wants to have that animal. So when the shelter rejects them, they are putting that animal in harm's way. There was one anecdote that I read about. I actually read about several, but this one really stayed with me that there was a man who was trying to surrender his dog to a selective admission shelter. And often these shelters will also have a fee for surrendering an animal, which PETA shelters don't. But this man tried to drop off his dog and the shelter was at capacity. So they said, try again in a few months. And the man just took his dog back outside and in the parking lot, ran the dog over with his car. So, this really illustrates why a no-kill shelter is not always better than a kill shelter. If the dog had been brought to PETA, I think that we can agree that being peacefully euthanized by a caring shelter worker is a way better way to die than to be run over in a parking lot. PETA does hold somewhat of a controversial stance when it comes to euthanization. They don't view it as necessarily bad to euthanize an animal, especially because keeping an animal alive in a shelter can be very cost and resource intensive. And frankly, there are just not enough homes for all of the animals that need to be adopted from shelters. Additionally, the longer an animal stays in a shelter, the more their mental health and demeanor declines, which actually makes them less adoptable over time. 
PETA actually believes that in certain cases where an animal is not really in that typical, um, very adoptable kind of range, that it is actually the kinder thing to euthanize them and maybe put those resources that would have otherwise gone into keeping the animal fed and um, have the vet bills taken care of and keeping the animal housed uh, towards other potentially higher impact animal rights activism. I'd also like to reiterate at this point that just because an animal is technically adoptable, it doesn't actually mean that there is somebody out there to adopt the animal. We talked about earlier, there are over 3 million animals that get left at animal shelters every year. So there just frankly are not enough homes for all of the homeless animals that we have. The reality is that a lot of healthy, happy, adoptable animals get euthanized, and it's obviously not just PETA that's doing it. And this doesn't sit well with me, obviously, but to believe that an organization like PETA somehow takes joy in killing these animals is naive and a bad faith interpretation of the situation. It's really easy for you and me to sit here and say that that doesn't sit well with us and we think that that's bad, but at the end of the day, we're not financially or logistically responsible for what happens to these animals, so I don't think it's really fair of us to make these calls. People like this who complain about PETA euthanizing animals remind me a lot of people who complain about abortion and say that abortion should not be legal and that people should just put unwanted babies up for adoption, but they themselves have never adopted a child and would never adopt a child and also don't actually care what happens to children who are put up for adoption. We're going to quickly revisit that 81% euthanization rate that was reported on the PETA Kills Animals website. There's actually a lot more to this number than they, surprise, surprise, uh, are giving you the context for. A huge reason for this number is that PETA themselves don't actually have a shelter where you could come and adopt a dog from. Any animals that they do receive that they believe are adoptable um, get sent to shelters that they're partnered with that are separate shelters. So PETA would receive an animal and animals that need to be euthanized are euthanized at the PETA shelter and adoptable animals are sent actually to a different shelter and these don't get factored into the kill versus adopted rate. The Center for Consumer Freedom obviously never mentions this because it makes the situation look a lot more reasonable. They also happen to conveniently always leave out the fact that PETA provides free or reduced vet care for families who have animals in need of that kind of thing. They also provide food and shelter for animals as well. They do a lot of work to try to keep the animals in their homes for as long as possible. Okay, this brings me to the most overlooked yet most important part of this discussion that I never see people talking about when they complain about PETA killing animals. And a lot of the time, I don't even see people who are defending PETA talking about this. And that is, why do these animals exist in the first place? Why do we have this surplus of animals who need to be euthanized? They exist because they are being bred into existence and then all those animals are not being properly spayed and neutered, which ends up with even more animals coming into existence. PETA would not have to euthanize these animals if people weren't irresponsibly allowing a bunch of animals to breed. The reason these animals exist in the first place are for two main reasons, and the first of which is that they are being bred into existence by breeders, and the second of which is that whether they are gotten from a breeder or otherwise, animals are not being responsibly spayed and neutered. If all animals were spayed and neutered, we would not have this massive surplus of companion animals that have nowhere to go. If you are appalled that PETA is euthanizing animals or that so many animals are being euthanized uh, just in general, you need to be aggressively opposing animal breeding and you need to be enthusiastically supporting free or low cost spay and neuter programs. If you have already in the past bought an animal from a breeder, I recommend maybe that you donate an equivalent amount of money that you spent to purchase the animal on supporting like either your local shelter or even better would be your local spay and neuter program. This is a statistic that I found while researching for this video and it blew my mind. It's on PETA's infographic that I will link down in the description. You should take a look at both of those. But the one in particular is this one. For one female cat and her litter, if they are unspayed, 
over seven years, I want you to have a guess in your mind for how many cats that can create, okay? Do you have your guess? It's 370,000 cats. One cat and her unspayed and unneutered litter turned into 370,000 cats. For dogs, that number is still a huge 67,000, but it's it's nowhere near 370,000, but even the 67,000 is so much more than I thought. Spaying and neutering is the answer to animal euthanization. And conveniently on that topic, PETA themselves have spayed and neutered over 200,000 animals. They have um, mobile spay and neuter clinics that offer free and reduced spaying and neutering services, and they will also uh, catch and release um, feral or homeless animals as well. The answer to companion animal euthanization and homelessness is not creating endless shelter space to house these animals, but it is spaying and neutering these animals so that they cannot create more animals who then also need to end up in shelters in the first place. So to wrap that section of the video up, yes, PETA does kill animals, but they do it from a place of compassion and kindness, and frankly, they're just dealing with the horrible mess of millions of homeless animals that have been created by people who carelessly do not spay and neuter their pets. What I'm about to say next is what I believe is probably the most important takeaway from this video, so listen up. If you aren't vegan and your main complaint about PETA is that they kill animals, then you are a hypocrite. When PETA kills animals, they're doing so from a place of compassion and kindness, and if you're not vegan, every single day you pay to have animals killed and abused on your behalf. There is no morally relevant difference between a dog and a pig. If you are not vegan, your opinion on PETA is irrelevant. Frankly, regardless of what your issue with them is. Because I'm assuming that you're a halfway decent person and that you're against animal suffering and animal torture. And again, if you're not vegan, you're directly contributing to that, whereas PETA, at the very least, is actively working to stop that. Now, with that being said, I do actually personally have a problem with PETA and believe that they've done some pretty inexcusable things. So stick around for that. Okay, so that's the biggest controversy out of the way. And up next, we have PETA steals animals. This one kind of goes hand in hand with the first one because the whole premise is that PETA steals animals to euthanize them because they have like a crazy belief that people having pets is unethical. And surprise, surprise, it's a lot more nuanced than that. To start off, there are actually only two cases of PETA ever stealing an animal, um, which if you have ever been on a Reddit thread about PETA, they will lead you to believe that it is like one of PETA's number one mission statements to steal as many pets as they can and kill them, which is obviously not true. The first case is one that I talked about earlier, which is the case of Maya the Chihuahua who was taken from her home and then euthanized by PETA. So this is obviously a really unfortunate situation, but when we actually look at what happened, it kind of starts to look a lot more reasonable. So there was a trailer park in which a resident had moved out and left a bunch of dogs behind. And the person who managed or owned the trailer park had called PETA because the animals were proving to be a nuisance to the other people who lived there. So PETA did show up and they picked up these animals and Maya, the chihuahua in question, was not on a leash, was not wearing a collar and got mixed up with these other animals and thereby was also picked up taken to the PETA shelter, and then swiftly euthanized. So in this case, the local laws were not followed because when an animal is taken, they are supposed to be held for a certain amount of time. That's definitely longer than 24 hours, and PETA obviously did not do that, which is suspicious and, of course, tragic for both Maya and her family. The second instance of PETA stealing animals was one time when a PETA representative found a dog on the side of the road and they picked the dog up. It seemed to be like a hunting dog and it turned out to be like the dog of the head of the animal control of that area and the dog was returned to uh, their, their owner. So that was settled really quickly so that animal was not euthanized. So it was a one-off thing. There are 
literally no other instances of PETA stealing animals, let alone PETA stealing and killing animals. I have seen a shocking amount of widespread fear-mongering that PETA is out to steal your animals. And to that one person who wrote that PETA loves stealing animals from homeless people, um, I'm wishing you an extra special terrible day because you just fabricated that piece of information like literally from nothing. For what? What would possess you to just like materialize that piece of information to like write in a Reddit comment? Like why would you do that? Complete lie. I often see people say that PETA is a bad organization because they objectify women. So PETA does frequently use both actual nude people or people in various states of undress um, in like live outreach, but they also have traditionally used people who are nude in some of their like visual campaigns. For example, their anti-fur campaign, which is like, I would rather go naked than wear fur. They have um, a lot of, especially female celebrities, but there are also some male celebrities that have taken uh, part in that campaign that uh, people take issue with. There was one where I think it was Wimbledon, they had um, two scantily like bikini clad women handing out strawberries with vegan ice cream. And they caught a lot of flack for this. And like I said, they're being called a sexist organization. And I think this is a pretty cheap shot. I think that calling PETA sexist is just an easy excuse to write them off. To me, actually, this is a pretty cut and dry situation. As somebody who is obviously not pro-sexualization or objectification, I acknowledge that the state of animal rights is dire. And it really constitutes a desperate times call for desperate measures kind of situation in my opinion. So I haven't personally seen any data that suggests that this is a particularly effective or ineffective uh, method for activism. So I'm not gonna comment on that, but it's clear that PETA does seem to think that it's effective. So we're just gonna assume, we're gonna take that out of the equation. So we're not gonna be debating whether it is or isn't effective in this section, but we're just gonna rather accept that PETA does do it. And for the sake of argument, I could imagine that from PETA's perspective, it's pretty easy to rationalize that people are far more likely to look at a naked body or a scantily clad person talking about veganism or handing out vegan products than they are somebody who's just dressed in regular clothes. And PETA's tactic for a long time has been just getting eyes onto their ideas. It's not PETA who sexualized women. PETA are simply capitalizing on the fact that society has sexualized women in order to advance their values and their beliefs. When you truly start to recognize how dire the situation that most animals are in is, it starts to not really matter. Like, if sexualizing bodies works, then I think that it's perfectly appropriate to do that. Like, the daily lives of the animals who are being farmed for their flesh and their milk and their eggs is truly awful. All of the people who agree to be in these campaigns know that information and they're consenting to be part of this campaign in this way. Not to mention that if we're gonna try and point a finger at PETA for using uh, naked bodies, especially those of women, we need to immediately also look over to the meat and dairy industries, which are very, very guilty of using these tactics to a degree that I think is far more insidious than PETA or any animal rights organization ever has. Because again, PETA is we'll say selling sex in order to improve the lives of billions of animals, whereas meat companies are using sex to sell suffering and dead bodies and to perpetuate the exploitation of all of these innocent sentient beings. So if we're gonna pick on PETA for being sexist, I'm gonna need that exact energy sent right back at the meat industry and whoever the heck was in charge of this abomination. I want to quickly talk about um, intentional misinformation and a specific instance that I saw it's being used against PETA in a way that like literally took my breath away. As I was doing my research, I came across a quote from Ingrid Newkirk, who is the founder and still is the president of PETA. And 
I'm going to read you the version of the quote that is circulated and the one that I first encountered. And I'm not going to lie, when I first found this quote, I was like, what, what is this? Like, this sounds horrible. I don't know if I want to support an organization whose, like, president would say something like this. But, okay, I'm just going to start by reading the quote. I would go to work early before anyone else got there, and I would just kill the animals myself. I must have killed a thousand of them, sometimes dozens a day. So that sounds pretty horrible. And I, like, I read this and I was like, oh my gosh, like, maybe I can't make this video. Like, maybe PETA is terrible. But then I found the actual quote, which goes like this. I went to the front office at the time and I would say, John is kicking the dogs and putting them in freezers. Or I would say, they are stepping on animals, crushing them like grapes and they don't care. In the end, I would go to work early before anyone got there and I would just kill the animals myself because I couldn't stand to let them go through that. I must have killed a thousand of them, sometimes dozens a day. Some of those people would take pleasure in making them suffer. So that quote is her talking about an animal shelter that she worked at before she ever founded PETA, where people were blatantly abusing and mistreating the animals that had to be euthanized. So she stepped in and she started euthanizing the animals herself because at least she was gonna do it with dignity, whereas the other people would, like she said, kick the dogs before. I have seen the maliciously shortened version that I read first, um, like on memes, on Facebook, and even in some articles that talk about PETA as an organization. That was like a huge eye-opening moment for me and it was just such a strong reminder that when we are reading or learning about anything that's controversial, especially as controversial as veganism in an organization like PETA, we always, always, always need to double check your source and try to find several sources for the information that you're internalizing. There was like another less consequential version of this that kept popping up, which was the supposed story that PETA activists had picked up some lobsters and then like, like taken them from somewhere that they were going to be eaten and that PETA like dumped them into a river, but all the lobsters died because they were saltwater instead of freshwater lobsters. And that is again, just a completely fabricated story that somebody invented just to put on Facebook, like for fun. So yeah, there are definitely several cases, many, many cases, I should say, of people just inventing nonsense because it makes them feel better to tear down an organization like PETA, as opposed to actually looking at themselves and aligning their actions with their morals and values. So for this part, I wanna go over some of the other PETA controversies that I've seen because I saw a lot of these pop up as reasons why people should not be supporting PETA, so I wanna take a moment to address them. Interestingly, I actually found that a lot of the controversies that people are still talking about and complaining about are quite old, like 15 to 20 years old in a lot of cases. So I'm gonna to try to keep things a little bit more recent than that. Most of the stuff that people complain about these days are things like bad social media posts or like stunts that they found were in bad taste. And the main example that I find people laughing at a lot is this tweet where PETA suggested using animal friendly language as opposed to language that is like more like animal negative. So instead of like kill two birds with one stone, it's feed two birds with one scone. They caught a lot of ridicule for this because like the average person who saw this on Twitter doesn't actually understand the way that language impacts uh, our perceptions of things and so they thought like that PETA should be putting their resources towards something that in their eyes is um, higher impact. Another example of this is they actually asked the MLB to change uh, the bullpen where like the pitchers warm up to the arm barn which was pretty poorly received as well. Another huge one was when on Steve Irwin's birthday PETA called out that Steve Irwin died because he was harassing a stingray. I'll put the tweet up here. And they caught a huge amount of flack. Like this is one that I've been seeing uh, over and over again when people say, oh, PETA is just a terrible tactless organization who are willing to tear down cultural icons to you know, advance their motives. I think that this one in particular is a good example of the problem that PETA has, which is like, it's true. Like Steve Irwin was harassing a stingray. If he hadn't gone near the stingray, he would not have died. Like that's kind of just a fact. And while this may be true, it is very socially tone deaf. And I feel like PETA is in a tricky spot where they're trying to walk that line pretty much every time they post on social media or say anything, which is 
walking the line of will this positively influence people's perception of veganism or will this negatively influence people's perception of veganism? And of course, there's like no real way of telling exactly how big of an audience something is going to reach. People really, really do not want to talk about things like veganism and animal rights. So PETA takes a chance and sometimes they will gamble on something like calling out Steve Irwin, a beloved public icon and they get massive backlash for this. It's tricky because, you know, there's the argument that all press is good press and that every time veganism is mentioned, a seed is planted and, you know, maybe somebody will eventually think a little bit more on that or it will accumulate into somebody maybe taking veganism, you know, more seriously as a concept. Or there's the alternative view that something like that is just gonna push people further away from veganism. And unfortunately, there isn't actually a way to know which one is happening. This brings me to my personal beef with PETA. One of the things that PETA is very well known for in the public eye is calling out celebrities for buying dogs from breeders versus praising celebrities when they adopt dogs. A pretty recent example of this, or recent-ish, is when Pete Davidson purchased a dog and he left a very well-publicized voicemail for PETA where he was like, he was very upset with PETA for daring to shame him for purchasing a dog rather than adopting a dog from a shelter. Thank you so much for making comments publicly that I didn't adopt a dog. I just want to let you know I'm severely allergic to dogs, so I have to get a specific breed. I'm only not allergic to cavapoos and those type of dogs. And my mom's dog, who was two years old, died a week prior and we're all so sad so i had to get a specific dog so why don't you do your research before you create news stories for people because you're a boring tired you and suck my end of message side note on that his reason was that he's allergic to all dogs except like it was some kind of like i don't think it was a cockapoo but like some kind of poodle mix and like maybe this is a hot take but if you're so allergic to dogs that the only way you can get a dog is unethical maybe you shouldn't have a dog however in this case where my personal beef with PETA came from is while I was researching this video which was a hot minute ago they had posted about Britney Spears getting a new dog and I'll put the post up here, it was like some kind of play on one of her songs and they basically called her out for buying this dog instead of adopting a dog from a shelter. Like I said, I was in the middle of researching this video, I was like knee deep in statistics about happy healthy animals having to be euthanized because there's no homes for them. So I was like, yeah, put that on my Instagram story. So I did. But then I did a little bit of my own research a few hours later and I found out that there was zero proof that Britney Spears had not adopted this dog. They had no evidence that she had purchased the dog from a breeder, and they instead jumped to the conclusion that she had purchased the dog, and thereby called her out on social media. In the past, she has both adopted dogs and purchased dogs, but in this particular case, no evidence of either. And yes, the dog is obviously a puppy, which is a cop-out of an adoption because puppies are always the easiest animals to adopt out. So the most meaningful way that you can adopt an animal is to adopt an older animal. But in my opinion, calling somebody out for something that you actually don't have evidence that they did is very low. This left such a bad taste in my mouth that I removed my Instagram story because integrity is incredibly important to me. I personally felt tricked by PETA because I had trusted that they knew what they were talking about and that they were a reputable organization who I could put my trust in in that way. And it turns out I could not. It legitimately broke my trust with them as an organization. On another quick side note, I want to take a moment to address some of the people in the comment section because I think they brought up an interesting point. People were saying that regardless of whether she had purchased the dog or not, it was inappropriate to call out Britney Spears because of the personal situation that she is going on in her life. Personally, I think that that is a ridiculous sentiment. If you have even an inkling of the horror that millions of homeless and shelter animals go through on a daily basis, the idea of hurting Britney Spears' feelings is so insignificant when compared with that. If she had actually purchased the dog, I think it would have been completely appropriate to call her out and take the opportunity to talk about the importance of adopting dogs versus buying them.
While we're on the topic of personal beef with PETA, I do want to call out a few things that I think that they've done that are genuinely unacceptable. And the first of those is their Got Autism ad. They did run this over 15 years ago and have since issued an apology and removed the information from their website, but this, even at the time, was just based on literally very, very almost non-existent science and was very insensitive to the autism community in general. The second one that I think is just straight up unacceptable is the it's time to lose the blubber ad. There's some kind of comparison between an overweight person and a whale, which is obviously very fat phobic and again, unacceptable. Aside from the obvious, like I mentioned, fat phobia, the other problem with this is that I think any tie between veganism and health is potentially harmful to veganism because you can be an overweight, unhealthy vegan. Veganism at its core has nothing to do with individual health. So I think that tying those things together is ultimately bad for veganism in the long run. Nobody is perfect and no organization is perfect. Any organization, especially one as big and controversial as PETA, who is quite literally trailblazing in a lot of ways, is bound to make mistakes. And I don't think that that justifies throwing the baby out with the bathwater. From what I can gather, PETA has two main issues. The first one is integrity. I know I spent a lot of time talking about how PETA is justified, or at least reasonably justified, in the euthanizing of um, companion animals that come into their shelters that are deemed unadoptable or otherwise unfit to continue living. However, I do think that there is a massive issue in the way that they talk about this, and that is in the way that they define adoptable. When you start to read a lot of their literature about why they euthanize animals and what they consider an acceptable circumstance under which to euthanize an animal, you'll see a lot of language talking about how the animals that come to them are sick and suffering and how they relieve these animals of, of their pain. I'm going to refer back to that infographic that I showed earlier. They state that they send almost every cute, young, friendly animal to open admission high traffic shelters. Where do the rest go? They said almost all cute and young animals. So that means that some cute young animals are getting euthanized. On the page that is a direct response to the PETAKillsAnimals.com, which is PETAKillsAnimalsScam.com, this is what they have to say. Like open admission animal shelters across the country, PETA performs the heartbreaking task of euthanizing animals who are unwanted for one reason or another, because they are aggressive, sick, hurt, elderly, or at death's door, and because no good homes exist for them. PETA, unfortunately, consistently uses evasive language whenever talking about this topic. And very interestingly, I actually saw a podcast, which was um, the Jamie's Corner podcast, which no shade at all. I love Jamie's work that she does. But in this particular podcast, she interviewed a PETA representative. And of course, the question of PETA kills animals came up. The PETA representative talked a lot about how PETA is a shelter of last resort, how they euthanize animals uh, out of kindness, the ones who are unadoptable. If that animal is adoptable, we will either, you know, place them in a good home or or we will bring them to a shelter, that, a high traffic shelter that we have a relationship with so they can be adopted. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't end up going into our numbers. What you see, what people see in our numbers are the animals who where PETA was the shelter of last resort, where, you know, they were brought there because because they they were at that at a point where they right. needed to be euthanized. But I think that if we look at the case of Maya the Chihuahua, who the family insists would have been a healthy, happy, and adoptable dog, yet she was euthanized within 24 hours of being picked up, which, like I mentioned, was actually against the law. I think the way that Peter talks about this issue actually makes me more suspicious and also makes other people, obviously, more suspicious of them as an organization. I honestly think that it would likely be a lot more compelling if PETA outright said, guess what? We do euthanize healthy, happy, adoptable animals. Sometimes these animals are young and could be a great companion animal for a loving home, but we have to euthanize them because there are too many animals. I genuinely think that this is more interesting, more to the point, and would probably even help sell their message of the importance of spaying and neutering animals better than what they're doing right now. However, given that 
The public response to PETA euthanizing animals at all has been extremely violent and negative and is already the focus of everything that is PETA related. Like maybe they've already analyzed the strategy and decided that outright admitting that they like euthanize puppies would like completely tank the organization. Maybe that's what's happening. But as it is, people are already highly suspicious. So I, I do genuinely wonder if that could be a better strategy. The second biggest issue that I see with PETA is some of their stunts just do not hit in the way they mean them to. For example, I saw like this one where they were protesting some form of wool. And the comments in this are not kind. I mean, even from a lot of vegans, I am actually totally with them. I think that this is a terrible stunt. I mean, respect to the people who did it for going out there and making things happen, but it's weird. It's weird, and I don't know if this is going to persuade anybody. This is a complaint that a lot of vegans have with PETA, is that they feel like PETA kind of makes veganism look silly with a lot of the stunts that they pull. And I think that I do unfortunately agree that a lot of the stunts do feel like it kind of makes it hard to take PETA as an organization seriously. However, from getting hundreds of companies to give up using fur, shedding light on animal testing, and getting companies to stop animal testing, to shutting down circuses that use animals, to the undercover investigations into farms and laboratories, PETA has had many wins. I strongly encourage you to check out PETA's milestone page, which I will link in the description of this video. I want you to really engage with some of those and then ask yourself if a few campaigns done in bad taste really undo all the good that they've done. So to quickly recap, Anything that comes from PETA Kills Animals or Center for Organizational Research and Education is propaganda that distorts the truth and weaponizes your cognitive dissonance to make you hate PETA because it directly serves them financially if you do. And if at the end of this video you still hate PETA, ask yourself honestly if there's anything I could have said that was going to change your mind. And if not, maybe recognize that your issue with PETA actually lies within yourself and that you should not be taking it out on PETA. Love PETA or hate PETA, you owe it to the animals to do your own research before you make a judgment and start perpetuating misinformation and harmful attitudes. And if you're vegan and you disagree with PETA for some reason, go out there and do a better job yourself. If you are vegan and you hate PETA, make sure that you're responsible in the way that you share that information. If you go around saying that PETA sucks without having an appropriate amount of nuance in the conversation, you're basically giving people a license to hate PETA and, as an extension, veganism. As it stands, PETA seems to be a reasonably good organization with good intentions. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it if you've stuck around this long. I found it really interesting and I learned a lot about PETA and I hope it inspires you to learn some more as well. If you feel that I left anything out, please let me know in the comments down below. I'm excited to carry on this conversation. Um, and if you are vegan, let me know what you think of PETA and if you aren't vegan, you're free to leave your worthless opinion in the comments as well. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.